adult psychiatrist from King's London, King's College London it's called, yes. And your perspective is somewhat different because uh, you treat adults and uh, not children with pan and pan, adult, adults with uh, psychotic... Psychotic disorders, that's Exactly. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you to Gunilla and to all the other organizers uh, of this conference uh, for inviting me. And it means a lot to be talking uh, to a bunch of researchers and also people with lived experience of PANS and uh, PANDAS because this disorder uh, had a really special role in the development of, of my career. I think it was around 2004 or 2005 that I first read a couple of papers by Susan Sweater, Sweeto, um, and they, they had such a huge impact on me that I think it, it shaped the sort of trajectory. <coughs> that I took afterwards. And although today my uh, research focuses uh, on adults rather than children, and it focuses on psychosis as the major psychiatric symptom rather than OCD, food restriction, uh, tics, I think the parallels between these two fields are really striking, and I hope that some of those will become apparent today. And actually, just having seen Professor Fry's talk just now, the parallels with the autism literature are already there. There are a few slides I'm about to show that may as well have been in, in Professor Fry's uh, uh, talk. That doesn't mean that you can't pay attention to them. But, uh, so, first of all, this is the only slide where I'm actually going to specifically mention PANS and PANDAS. Um, so, as everyone knows, psychosis is not part of the diagnostic criteria uh, for PANS and PANDAS, uh, but studies, case series have shown that it does occur, psychotic symptoms do occur, and I think the most comprehensive study to date uh, was a fairly recent one from the Stanford group, where they found that psychotic symptoms are present, or at least one psychotic symptom is present in about a third, or just over a third of patients with PANS and PANDAS. And these are hallucinations, most commonly. They can be auditory and visual at about the same rate, and they tend not to be threatening or pejorative. And that's really interesting because um, in, in the sort of functional psychoses, things like schizophrenia, particularly in adults, uh, auditory hallucinations are a lot more common, and they do tend to be scary or threatening or pejorative. Uh, and you can see that there's not very much by way of delusions or thought disorganization, which of course in the, in the adult psychoses you do see an awful lot more. There was no association with age or sex or time to treatment, uh, but there was this interesting association with the severity of symptoms, the degree of functional impairment, uh, and also caregiver burden. And if you look at this graph, you can see that the psychotic symptoms all tended to appear within the first year of diagnosis, uh, suggesting that for, that for those patients who do experience these symptoms, it, it, it is part of the, 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 the sort of core part of the, the disorder and is central to, to the disorder when, when they occur. Um, if we go back to Sydenham's career, which as everyone knows is this kind of archetypal post-infectious autoimmune encephalopathy that we're interested in here, it's interesting that, that the people who have Sydenham's career are at a greatly increased risk uh, of developing uh, schizophrenia subsequently. And that's interesting because this relationship between autoimmune disorders and psychosis is a really, really strong and, 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 and well-replicated relationship. This is a meta-analysis that uh, we did recently and I only show you this slide that has got so many lines. This is just to show you the number of studies that have looked at the relationship uh, between psychotic disorders and schizophrenia uh, or, or psychosis. Um, and just to kind of summarize what, what the, the, the literature looks like, you can see that no matter how you define the relationship, whether you're talking about general comorbidity, people who have both disorders, or whether you're talking about the temporal relationship, so whether the autoimmune disorder, and we're focusing here on systemic autoimmunity, not brain autoimmunity, so uh, whether the autoimmune disorder precedes the psychosis, or whether the psychosis precedes the autoimmune disorder, the relationship still holds. And it doesn't really matter how you de define the psychosis, whether it's just schizophrenia, narrowly defined, whether it's psychosis more broadly defined, or whether you get rid of all the schizophrenia cases and talk about non-schizophrenia psychosis, you still have that relationship. And when you start drilling down and looking at the individual autoimmune disorders, you have a need for pernicious anemia, ankylosing spondylitis, celiac disease, Graves' disease, pemphigoid, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, these all have a significant relationship. But interestingly, particularly given, given um, Jennifer Frankovich's talk uh, yesterday, uh, ankylosing spondylitis and rheumatoid arthritis appear to have a negative association with psychosis. So if you have these disorders, you are probably less likely to develop psychosis. And it's one of the few sort of protective factors that we know about in medicine uh, against the development of psychosis. And of course, no one has a clue why. Um, so this is a kind of legal requirement to show this uh, slide if anyone's ever going to talk about the relationship between psychosis and the immune system. Uh, this is what we call a Manhattan plot. It's sort of a genome-wide association study showing the variants that associate with increased schizophrenia risk. 
And essentially, uh, any of these lines which comes across, which uh, go higher than this sort of uh, bicep, this line here, have genome-wide significance. They increase the likelihood of developing uh, psychosis. And you can see this very significant hit here. Well, this is the HLA region on chromosome 6, which was already alluded to uh, by Professor Fry. This contains the major histone compatibility complex and is essential for directing the body's adaptive immune response, that part of the immune response which has immune memory and is directed towards specific pathogens. Um, and uh, as we know, uh, HLA variants are, are associated with almost all or very many different kinds of autoimmune disorders. What's interesting is that in schizophrenia, we haven't been able to drill down into specific causal variants. We know there's something happening in that region, but we're not really sure exactly what it is. Um, and uh, since 2014, this really increased attention in, 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 in this kind of area, because as well as this HLA region, there are a couple of other hits which surprise people, including uh, hits related to B-cell development. And of course, B-cells are the cells that produce antibodies. Or well, at least they're, they're, they're associated, they're, they're, their descendants are. So most people here will be familiar uh, with this book, I would assume. Uh, I don't know if anyone's seen the movie. Uh, probably if you haven't, don't. Uh, it's, got, uh, it's not as good as the book. Uh, so this is the story of, of Susanna Kaplan. And, and the reason why I, I include this is because the evidence I've shown you so far is, is, is epidemiological, uh, so focusing on very large populations, or it's genetic, which also focuses on you know, these genome-wide studies. It's tens of thousands of people. But how does that affect you as a clinician? If you're sitting in front of a patient, how do you know whether autoimmunity plays a role in that individual patient? And I think this is a problem for all of psychiatry. We have these findings which make sense at a population level, but how do we know if it makes sense on an individual level? And well, there's definitely one kind of autoimmunity which we do know can cause psychosis and is intimately related with it, and it's this disorder, it's NMDA receptor encephalitis. Uh, Susanna Kaplan, she was in her early 20s, she was living in New York, she was doing very well, uh, she had a good job as a journalist, uh, she had a, a great relationship. She started to become worried about bed bugs, as people tended to in, in, in New York at that time, there was a sort of epidemic of bed bugs, uh, but no one else but her could see these, these bed bugs. She then um, became paranoid that maybe her family was filming her or trying to set her up for some sort of TV show. Uh, she became more and more paranoid. She was taken to a psychiatrist who, in this story, is portrayed as this kind of uncontemplative, uh, fairly kind of knee-jerk uh, clinician who uh, describes her as having a sort of stress-related, maybe alcohol-related um, uh, reaction. Uh, eventually, the diagnosis, I think, changes to schizoaffective disorder. She's put on some uh, medication which of course doesn't work, she gets worse, but it's only when she collapses with a seizure and is taken to a general hospital that the neurologist, Dr. Suhan Najar, uh, who's portrayed as this kind of Dr. House kind of angelic figure, uh, he comes in, you know, there's this very stark contrast between the two approaches. Uh, he comes in, he does these investigations, and he finds a positive test result which leads to her diagnosis, and this is uh, NMDA receptor antibodies. Uh, and she was indeed one of the first patients with this disorder. Um, she received immunotherapy, she got, she got very well, uh, fairly quickly, well enough to write the book, and she's now about to come out with a second book, I think, about the history of psychiatry, and she still works as a journalist, so she's done very well. In 2007, this disorder was first described by Joseph Dalmau, we've heard a little bit about it so far. Um, uh, he was working in Pennsylvania, he's now in Barcelona. Essentially, it's an acute encephalopathy. Uh, excuse me if I say encephalopathy or encephalopathy, sometimes I'm a bit inconsistent, I'm British and we can't make our mind up about anything. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it, it has this characteristic progression, it starts with these kind of prodromal flu-like symptoms, uh, developing to psychiatric symptoms which include sleep disturbance, then a movement disorder which is typically catatonia but you also see dyskinesias, um, autonomic dysfunction, this can progress to coma and even death. Initially, there was this association with ovarian teratoma, a kind of ovarian tumour. Uh, we now know that probably around uh, a third or under a third of patients actually have this tumour. But in terms of the psychiatric symptoms in this initial series, uh, there were anxiety, agitation, psychosis, by which I mean delusions, paranoia, hallucinations, and catatonia. But crucially, about 80% of these patients initially presented to psychiatric services before the neurological symptoms developed. So they were seen by psychiatrists, and it was only when like Susanna, neurological symptoms entered the clinical picture that they were then seen by neurologists. And if you look at the age distribution of these kind of initial symptoms, uh, so on the right you have the patients who are over 18 years old, and everything that's in blue uh, is described here as behavior, cognition, memory deficit. I don't know if anyone speaks neurologies, uh, but it's the, 
kind of language that neurologists, I think, use to describe psychiatric symptoms. They're not very good at talking about psychiatric symptoms in much detail, so they say behavior, and that's like the whole of the psychiatric textbook. Uh, so I, I, I think what they're referring to largely is a certain kind of psychosis, um, but other psychiatric symptoms as well. And you see that the, the younger you get, the less likely you are to present with those uh, sort of psychiatric symptoms initially. But um, there have actually been some studies coming from California suggesting that actually even the young ones can present uh, at higher rates than this uh, with psychosis. And maybe it's a question of recognizing psychosis in these young kids, or maybe it's the fact that the movement disorder or the seizures kind of overshadow uh, the, the other symptoms. But this same group in one of the early series found that 4% of patients with this disorder had isolated psychotic episodes, either at presentation or relapse. They did not develop any neurological symptoms whatsoever, so potentially they were not distinguishable from psychiatric patients. Uh, and interestingly, at relapse, it's about a quarter of all patients who just present psychiatrically, and certainly we see that quite a lot. So, what about, what, are, what is the psychiatric phenotype? Well, we did a, a sort of retrospective case study of some of the patients in, in our hospital, and contrary to this idea that it's mainly just hallucinations and delusions that you see, um, actually, the symptomatology is a bit more subtle. You see the so-called negative symptoms of psychosis, things like flattening of affect, things like social withdrawal. Uh, you see a lot of cognitive disorganization, thought disorder. So in many ways, these are the kind of things which are a little bit reminiscent of schizophrenia. So, you know, are they distinguishable? Well, there's um, a colleague of mine, and this is a study I was involved with, it was published recently in Lancet Psychiatry, Adam Aldawani, who had a lot of spare time on his hands, he went back through every single case study that had ever been published of NMDA receptor encephalitis and documented the psychiatric symptomatology in very minute detail. And he was able to extract sort of seven major categories and then a whole number of minor categories. So you can see these major categories here. You have behavior. So he's a psychiatrist and he still uses the word behavior, but at least he describes what it means, you know, uh, agitation, uh, aggression, there's some sexual behavior, uh, impulsivity, violence. Then you have uh, the core psychotic, positive psychotic symptoms, uh, mood symptoms, catatonic symptoms, suicidality, this is a problem. People do kill themselves with this disorder, either in the acute phase or, or afterwards. Um, eating problems, uh, and, and at the bottom there's obsessive compulsive problems, and that's certainly something that I've seen in one or two cases. Um, but at a fine grade level as well, you can see that some of these symptoms are more common than others. And what he did then was he said, well, hold on, if you compare these symptoms to the textbook definitions of the kind of psychiatric disorders that we see in psychiatric practice, things like DSM-5, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, do they line up? And the simple answer is no. There's no easy one-to-one -one correspondence with the psychiatric phenotype of these patients as described uh, uh, with the textbook definitions of these disorders. And so that might be cause for celebration, right? You could be like, well, it's easy to spot these patients if you're working in the hospital. It's a bit like picking out the apples in a basket of apples and oranges. They're very different. But of course, we don't actually work with the textbook definitions of DSM-5. We don't. No one comes into hospital with DSM-5 schizophrenia or, 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 or ICD-10 schizoaffective disorder. In reality, these 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 uh, illnesses are much more varied. I, I think psychosis is probably the most heterogeneous disease in the whole of medicine, let alone in, in psychiatry. Uh, and and so it's sometimes really difficult. And I think rather than trying to pick out apples in a bowl of apples and oranges, you've also got mangoes and pomegranates and, 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 and pears in there, and actually, clinically, this is a real challenge. So how are we going to do it? So coming back to Susanna, she asked this really important question. She says, how many people are currently in psychiatric homes and in wards and in nursing homes being denied the relatively simple cure of steroids, plasma exchange, or more intense immunotherapies? And I think what she's asking is, are there patients who are in psychiatric hospitals at the moment who actually have an immunotherapy responsive cause for their psychosis, and they are receiving either inadequate or possibly even inappropriate treatment. Well, she wasn't the first person to ask this. Well, well other people were asking it at the same time. And this group from Cambridge, um, they were interested in disease-relevant antibodies in first episode psychosis. So they took a series of patients from an outpatient clinic. These are patients who are well enough to be going to the clinic and back home, who are some of them may even have been holding down a job with first episode psychosis. They tested them for these antibodies, and they found that 7% of the antibodies that are potentially disease-relevant. Interestingly, the patients with the antibodies were not distinguishable from the patients without the antibodies, again, suggesting that the clinical phenotype is not always that easy to, to pick out. And if you're interested in the way that, that, that this literature is going, this one patient who they gave plasmapheresis followed by steroids, you might see him as a kind of patient zero because he got better, I think it was a he, got better 
uh, and did not require uh, any antipsychotic treatment and apparently has, has stayed well. Well, that was in 2011, and there have now been a number of studies looking at the prevalence of these antibodies in pretty much every kind of psychiatric disorder that you can uh, imagine. And uh, I did a meta-analysis in 2013. We're about to update it. Um, it should be out fairly soon. But to summarize the literature, it's an absolute mess. Uh, there are some studies which show that patients with psychosis have a higher proportion of antibodies. There are some which show that they don't. Um, we think it's probably very much down to the assay which is used. Some assays appear to show equal prevalence, some don't. Um, but it's clinically, this is a real problem. And a lot of the enthusiasm uh, that was around initially has been tempered somewhat. But there's still some amazing things in the literature. So these are some examples. Uh, any MDA receptor antibodies presenting as atypical anorexia nervosa in adolescents. NMDA receptor antibodies mimicking an autistic regression. There's about, I think, three or possibly four papers showing this, and they're all reasonably convincing, I would say. Um, a case of treatable immuno uh, dementia with Lewy bodies with NMDA receptor antibodies improved by immunotherapy. Uh, dementia with Lewy bodies isn't meant to get better. Uh, LGR1 antibody encephalitis, which normally causes a kind of movement disorder, well, this is here presenting with psychosis. Uh, this is a paper from us about an MDA receptor antibodies in mania, which I'm going to discuss a little bit later. Uh, dopamine D2 receptor and NMDA receptor antibodies in the first episode of psychosis in children. This is from the Sydney Duke group of Russell Dale. Uh, thyroid antibodies presenting as major depression. Uh, NMDA receptor antibodies in patients with intellectual disability presenting with catatonia or neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Some of these are fairly convincing. Um, there's a lot of papers which are, are, are less convincing. And, then, and I think for us, one of the problems is where are you measuring these antibodies? What are you looking at? And there was this feeling five years ago, this real sense of enthusiasm and hope in the psychiatric community that we finally found a biomarker that you can test, just do a quick blood test on your patients. If it comes back positive, you're like, boom, maybe only 5%. But for those 5% of patients you can treat with immunotherapy, they're going to get better, and this is potentially going to change lives. And unfortunately, the Germans came along and showed that this wasn't necessarily uh, the case. They took around, I think, 4,500 patients and they tested antibodies uh, to every single target that's been associated with encephalitis that you can think of. They tested every single subtype in huge numbers. And they found that unambiguously there was no differential prevalence in, um, in, in psychotic patients, other psychiatric patients, uh, uh, healthy controls. So what are you going to make of this? Should we just kind of give up? Well, what they actually did was they've shown some really interesting basic science, which I won't have time to show you today, uh, to show that actually what you need to take into account, so it was great to hear Dritan Agalyu talking about this yesterday, is, is the blood-brain barrier. Because it might be that dysfunction of the blood-brain barrier is the factor that determines whether an antibody which is floating around the periphery is able to get to your brain uh, and affect the, uh, the synaptic function and cause symptoms. Uh, and there's a lot, a lot of preclinical models um, uh, demonstrating this. I, uh, some of the work I've done as well has been attempting to, to do this as well. It's very hard to measure blood-brain barrier disruption in humans, particularly if you're not doing a lumbar puncture on these patients. But there is this sort of venerable history of blood-brain barrier disruption in psychosis, which goes back really to the 60s, and it seems as though this is a really replicable finding. So what should we make of, of, of blood tests in this disorder? Should we continue to be doing it? I think outside of a clinical trial, I think we should not be relying on blood tests. But sure enough, there is a clinical trial which is hopefully going to answer this question. It's called the Synapse Trial. Belinda Lennox from Oxford is one of the PIs. Alistair Coles from Cambridge. And the idea is to randomise 80 patients, half of whom uh, will they'll all have uh, antibodies, mainly an NDA receptor antibodies, we think. Half of whom will get uh, IVIG and rituximab. The other half will get sham IVIG and rituximab. Um, and the idea is to look at uh, time to sustain remission uh, over six months. They'll all be given antipsychotic treatment as usual because we don't think it's ethical to withhold antipsychotic treatment when we don't know about the efficacy uh, of, of, of these treatments. But of course, in order to find enough patients when the, pop when the sort of prevalence of these antibodies is 5% or even a little bit lower, you have to screen absolutely loads. And this is why it's become this sort of massively multi-sensor study and one of the local PIs. Um, but it's very difficult because oftentimes uh, psychiatric, psych acutely psychotic patients really won't want to be involved in a trial like this. So I have hoped to be able to present some sort of uh, exciting criteria which, 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 which are impressed at the moment and unfortunately haven't been published uh, by today. Uh, so we, I've been working with um, a bunch of other psychiatrists, neurologists, neuroimmunologists to, to develop a, a consensus guidelines on the approach to diagnosis and management of autoimmune psychosis. And essentially, 
We're going pretty conservatively. I think Kiki Chang spoke yesterday about the need to get the foot in the door when it comes to uh, developing guidelines and not to go too far out there. So what we've done is outline a relatively conservative red flag based approach. So if your patient has any of these red flags, then uh, we advise testing and pretty in-depth testing, which includes CSF analysis, EEG, MRI. Um, and these are sort of red flags which are typically associated with, with, with autoimmune encephalopathies. They do occur in, psych in psychotic disorders individually. Uh, but we want to, we, we, you know, we want to be able to, to, to screen a good number of patients. Um, there's a reduced emphasis on serum only tests. And in, in, the, in our criteria, which I'm not able to show you in full now, a serum only antibody is not enough for diagnosis. You need extra paraclinical evidence. So that's MRI, EEG, but particularly CSF analysis, which really takes center stage. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that, I'm just going to show you now, this is a study from uh, an Australian group. Uh, we wrote a, uh, an editorial on this because we thought it, it, it should actually uh, affect practice along with a few other studies which had similar findings. So what these authors in Queensland, Australia did was they recruited prospectively acutely psychotic first episode psychosis patients. They tested for NMDA, VGKC, GAD and some of the antibodies which are associated with cancers. And of 113 patients who consented, and crucially, a lot of the patients were not able to consent at the time that they had the blood taken, but they were retrospectively asked for their consent. And that's important because this is the only study which has really looked at patients who are super ill, uh, and, and, and possibly that's going to maximize the signal that you get. So they found four patients had NMDA receptor antibodies. I'm not going to talk about the other antibodies today, but any patient who had an antibody also got a lumbar puncture. If you just look at the results here, I'm, a, I'm only interested in these first four patients. You can see they're 28 years old, 16 years old, 13, 33. They've all got fairly normal uh, psychiatric diagnoses. Substance-induced psychosis, uh, acute and transient psychotic disorder, bipolar affective disorder. And their duration of psychosis is pretty short. Uh, certainly, they're not these long prodromal periods that you typically see in a first episode psychosis. But I'm interested in what happens when you do a lumbar puncture and you look in their CSF. Well, the first two patients have got grossly abnormal uh, CSF. They have high white cells, they've got NMDA receptor antibodies in their CSF. And in fact, both of these patients went on to develop seizures uh, and they developed a full-blown encephalopathy where I think they were both found to have a teratoma. So these were patients who were unambiguously NMDA receptor encephalitis, but caught early. And we know that in these disorders, time is brain. So that shows that you know, if you do look for these antibodies early enough, you might be able to catch people pretty early on. This, this, this patient's three and four that I'm really interested in because they also had inflammatory CSF. They had oligoclonal bands, one of them had NMDA receptor antibodies in the CSF. Patient four didn't have antibodies, but he had very raised white cells and protein. And these were patients who never went on to develop these neurological symptoms. They just stayed looking like a normal psychiatric patient. But they did receive immunotherapy. And of course, this is open label, so you have to take it all with a bit of a pinch of salt. But I should emphasize that even in the field of autoimmune encephalitis, there have been no randomized control, uh, control trials uh, whatsoever to date. Um, so these patients all got better with immunotherapy and have been able to remain off antipsychotics. So I think the, the, the take home message is, if you don't look for these patients, you're not going to find them. But the question is, you know, how do you look? Should you be screening for these antibodies in the blood? I'm not sure about that. I think really we need to be a little bit more assertive. And, this is from the, uh, a Danish group based in, in Copenhagen, uh, and they do these uh, you know, amazing epidemiological studies and sometimes meta-analyses, and they've shown that the rate of CSF abnormalities in psychosis is, is really pretty high. You can see that um, there's increased protein as a meta-analytical level, there's an increased CSF serum albumin ratio, which is a marker of blood-brain barrier dysfunction, and really I, I think the evidence for that is, 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 is fairly convincing. Uh, increased cytokines, of course. But they actually mentioned two studies which report the rate of diagnostic change. So if you do CSF analysis, how often does your diagnosis change? Uh, on these patients, and they found that the diagnosis was changed in such a way that management was altered in between 3 and 6% of patients. And overall, lumbar puncture was actually pretty acceptable. Bear in mind that a lot of German psychiatrists uh, are able, you know, do lumbar puncture fairly routinely. So the question is, should we be doing this in all our acutely psychotic patients? Uh, the pros are, well, you can pick up these potentially management-changing abnormalities. Uh, we do MRI in an awful lot of our patients, some, play, some places I think do them in all, in all acute onset psychosis patients. And in fact, the, the pickup of abnormalities that could change management with MRI is probably about 1 or 2%. And if we're talking about 3 or 6% with a lumbar puncture, then surely 
it's, a, it's an investigation that's worthwhile. And I think we need to talk more and more about there being a parity of esteem between mental health and physical health. Why should one group of patients get these investigations and another group of patients not? Um, I think, of course, there are cons. There's increasing patient anxiety. There's giving patients a sort of potentially false hope that there might be an organic cause for their illness, and that turns out not to be the case. And, of course, it's outside of psychiat psychiatrists' expertise. Uh, but so what, right? We should, maybe we should get, get ourselves trained up and learn to get our hands dirty again. Um, so we, we've got a study which we're just starting in London called the Baseline Biomarker Check, or BBC uh, study, and um, this essentially is doing a whole range of biomarker tests at patients when they present the first episode of psychosis, hoping to get 500 patients within a year with a very, very busy, deprived South London uh, uh, community. Uh, we're going to offer all patients uh, a lumbar puncture. We're hoping that a fair number of them are going to accept it. And the idea really is to look at what predicts anti uh, antipsychotic response or treatment response. Uh, can we find any predictive biomarkers? And the treatment will be entirely naturalistic. It's not a trial. Um, but of course, you know, if there are abnormalities in the CSF, we'll be able to tell what proportion of patients is as high as 6% uh, abnormalities. And the patients will then be diverted uh, to our clinical service. I run an autoimmune encephalitis clinic joined with a neurologist, Esther Coutinho. Um, and of course, the other patients will get uh, psychiatric treatment as usual. So we're quite excited about this and hopefully be able to present the findings at, at some point soon. This is coming back to this Danish group who have shown again and again that not only do autoimmune disorders increase your risk of uh, a psychosis diagnosis, but infections do the same thing too. And in fact, the infections can increase your risk in a kind of dose-response relationship. The more infections you have, the more likely you are to have a subsequent diagnosis of psychosis. And there's also this really interesting temporal relationship, so that in the month following an infection, you are more likely to be newly diagnosed with psychosis compared to, say, the six months after that. Um, so infections in psychiatry, there's this kind of long and venerable history. Um, you know, in the 1700s, there are stories of people with influenza becoming acutely psychotic. Back then, influenza was not really perceived as a respiratory disease. It was a multi-system disease. People talk, talked about the psychosis of influenza. Um, coming back to this century, Wagner Jarek was the first psychiatrist to win the Nobel Prize. Uh, and he gave for malarial therapy in treating dementia paralytica, which was a kind of uh, manifestation of syphilis. Um, Quite a lot of the patients died, uh, but a lot of them got better as well. And if you think that the other one of the other psychiatrists who won a Nobel Prize was Moniz for doing the prefrontal lobotomy, you can see that we haven't done particularly well in terms of ethical treatments winning Nobel Prizes in psychiatry. So if anyone wants to <laughs> try and push something <laughs> a little bit less sinister, then please do try. Uh, but I, I think it, it was really the start of immunopsychiatry, and it broke through some of that nihilism that these are disorders which are chronic and cannot get better. Uh, encephalitis lethargica followed the influenza pandemic in 1918, um, and lots of people think it might be a sort of para-infectious phenomenon, although that's controversial. And then there was this finding that people with schizophrenia are more often born in winter than they are in other seasons, and that was followed up by these uh, epidemiological and ecological studies showing that if you're born in a year where there's an influenza pandemic, you're more likely to have uh, psychosis. And some of this relates to the kind of maternal uh, infection or maternal immune activation or maternal antibody transfer models that, that Professor Fry was re uh, referring to, because similar risks have been observed in some other disorders like autism. Um, and today there's just this huge literature that obviously I can't summarize today implicating multiple organisms. Herpes viruses I'm particularly interested in, influenza too, toxoplasma, and there's an emerging role for the microbiome. So toxoplasma is, is interesting. Uh, there's a mouse sitting on a cat here, and the reason is the mouse is no longer scared of the cat. Uh, they, when animals get infected, it appears to affect their fear responses, possibly in a way that allows the organism to continue replicating itself because the mouse then eats, sorry, the cat then eats the mouse, um, and that enables the, the, the replication to continue, the life cycle to continue. But when humans are infected, and it's possible that up to about 50% of us here might be infected, uh, then it can affect the, the, the way that our brains work. And it's just been associated with impulsive behavior, increased risk of suicide, self-harm, automobile accidents. Uh, it can cause, I'll, I'll show you in this evidence, that, that brain-reactive antibodies can be produced. And there's this increased risk of schizophrenia and possibly other psychiatric disorders. Um, and in fact, a big mega-analysis of risk factors for schizophrenia recently identified toxoplasma IgG as the only lab-testable marker which reliably uh, predicts schizophrenia risk. That includes all the neuroimaging markers, all the other sort of lab-testable markers that are, that are out there. 
And there's this long, aggressively fought battle about whether childhood cat ownership might be a risk factor for schizophrenia, and it's been running for a very long time. I wouldn't get rid of your cat yet, because it sort of hasn't quite been decided. But in this field, the, the one area which I'm very interested in is this idea that infection can induce autoimmunity, kind of bringing all these themes together, right? So toxoplasma, if you infect uh, mice with toxoplasma, they produce NMDA receptor antibodies. These antibodies targeting the NR2 receptor rather than the NR1 receptor, which is the one that's implicated with encephalitis. Uh, and also you get these sort of uh, behavioral changes which relate to the level of anti NMDA receptor antibody production. And then the effect is more marked if the infection happens in adolescence, mirroring what you see in psychosis. Um, there's also a lot of really interesting studies in silico study now looking at the structure of viruses uh, and other pathogens and seeing whether there's molecular overlap between these the structures, so-called sequence homologies between these uh, and some of the proteins which are important in schizophrenia. And we're very interested in influenza and we've started a large project looking at different influenza strains and at the sequence homologies that they have with schizophrenia relevant proteins. In a way, trying to look at this molecular mimicry hypothesis which should be familiar to people here from the streptococcus story. And the question is, well, what's happening there? Well, I, I kind of locate this in the um, sort of literature which has shown that people who have a herpes simplex encephalitis or infection can get a secondary autoimmune response, producing antibodies to brain receptors like the NMDA receptor or other brain receptors that can then cause what might look like a relapse, but in fact is not really a relapse of the herpes simplex encephalitis, it's a sort of post-infectious autoimmune encephalitis, and very typically in adults presents with predominant psychiatric symptoms. And interestingly, we now think that it's not specific just to herpes, and it may not be specific just to herpes simplex encephalitis, because actually there's evidence of people who just have um, evidence of previous infection to herpes, so possibly related to cold sores or, 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 or genital sores, they actually have an increase, they, they are overrepresented in patients with NMDA uh, receptor encephalitis. So whether this is a molecular mimicry story or something about the neuronal destruction caused by the initial viral encephalitis, which is causing a, a sort of secondary immune response, we don't know, but it ties in so nicely with what we know about PANS and PANDAS, where an initial infection can result in secondary autoimmunity, or at least that's what we think is going on. So, to conclude, this autoimmunity is a risk factor for psychosis and vice versa. Autoimmune psychosis certainly exists, but it really requires a high burden of evidence to avoid false diagnosis or incorrect diagnosis in these patients. I think that lumbar puncture should become a, a, a routine part of assessment in all patients with psychosis. Infections are a risk factor for psychosis, but in, as in so much of psychiatry, it's very hard to move from the general to the specific, and I think we always need to remember that. I think there's a role for the microbiome, which I wasn't able to talk about. And I also think we need to talk about the microbiome and pans and pandas a little bit more, um, because I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Uh, and I think this idea of infection-induced autoimmunity is a really promising potential mechanism that we need to pursue a little bit more. Uh, so that's all I've got to say. I'm sorry I've gone over a little bit. Uh, thank you to all my collaborators. Thank you.